Here's Tony Rielli. Multitudinous issues coming out of Falcon Saints last night. Sean Payton right there. Do you guys see a Super Bowl choke taunt? I think you do. Dan Quinn not taking the penalty in fourth and one. What was that about? Drew Brees into traffic on second down. The game-killing interception. What was that about? Payton in the meltdown with the refs. What was that about? And also this. Is this a trip? Is it an accident? What is that about? Tim Callis Show, it's all in play for you. You're first. Have at it. I thought it was a night of bad decisions, and Matt Ryan made a lot of them, and Drew, Drew Brees made one on his final pass. I thought Dan Quinn probably made the worst decision mm. to not take a, a penalty because it was really like fourth and a foot. Uh, and he, was, he would have made him, forced him to, uh, to go back 10 yards and maybe out of field goal range if they don't get anywhere on third down. But then Sean Payton, you know, wrapped it up at the end. I still don't think you throw that flag there. I realize he ran a little farther on the field than we're used to seeing coaches go. But we've seen him come out on the field to call timeouts uh, when they're not getting the ref's attention. And when you call it there, I mean, you end the game. So, you know, poor decision for sure by Sean, but bad decision by the officials too. Mina Kimes? It was a bad decision, but it doesn't excuse his unprofessional behavior, including the you know choking thing, which we all saw what that was. Uh, we talk a lot about how Thursday night football affects players, but it seems to have short-circuited these coaches because, as Tim pointed out, they were terrible throughout the game. It wasn't just Dan Quinn's decision at the end not to accept the holding penalty, but his time management at the end of the half also cost the Falcons. It was awful. He is very lucky that Deion Jones bailed him out because otherwise he would be getting roasted today. Mm -hmm. Kay Fagan, what did you see last night? more of like a big picture takeaway one on the saints front is like man i know i knew how good camara was but it was pretty eye-opening how much the saints lean on that rookie i mean i think we all think of the saints and we're like no they're being carried by drew Brees because that's how they've always been carried but it was pretty revelatory once he got injured how much that offense does rely on his productivity and when you look at the Atlanta side of the ball one of the big picture takeaways for me was the defense and how they do seem and now it's hard to say for sure because the Saints were hamstrung by that injury but the Atlanta defense now in the second half of games seems to have figured some things out because they knew that was their Achilles heel was playing poorly as the game is ending you saw at least them locked down at the end of this game to secure that win and now you have to ask yourself all right, well, it was the Atlanta's offense that we thought carried them last year, and now could their defense carry them into the playoffs this year? KB, were you asking questions about some of those decisions by the coaches, or were you finding yourself thinking the Falcons got a big win? Well, let's talk about the Falcons since no one has because they've been won now four of the last five games. They were able to hold down that Saints um, uh, offense. Uh, that was their lowest point uh, outburst of the of the year, just 17 points. Um, they got a win that they probably should have gotten anyway at home. Uh, they did what they had to do to position themselves to get out of the wild card hunt and get into the uh, the playoff stack. Um, but it was bad decision making all the way around. First bad decision is NFL Thursday Night Football, as we all know. Um, but then. Drew Brees throwing that pick and the fact that uh, Kate pointed out the, the, the uh, contributions of, of um, the rookie running back uh, Kamara, uh, but you know what? Mark Ingram was in there for that play when they're, when they're throwing the ball into the end zone. Give the ball to Mark Ingram. He's a pretty good running back too. Tim, did you find yourself having more faith in the Falcons after winning last night? Not really because I think the Falcons are the luckiest team in the NFL this year uh, and a lot of it's on Matt Ryan. Quarterbacks are 2-20 and 20 when they throw three interceptions. Matt Ryan is the two. He's done it twice. And everybody else, the game's over when they throw three picks. Mina, same question to you. No, I think the Saints were too diminished by injuries to say they put up a fair fight. They are the better team still. Real quick on the Sean Payton front, all right, the choke sign. That trip is also a little bizarre. At the end. Is that something that might be a phone call coming from league office to, to Payton, Kate Fagan, in your opinion? Should there be? Well, I, I want to see it a little bit closer because I, the, the trip on the back, I mean, that is kind of an old school move on the basketball court is tripping a guy on mm. the way up the court. Sounds like you're speaking the from experience together. here. Okay. No, so, like, I, I would want to see it more because it does seem like the kind of thing you kind of do and then you get away with because it seems so innocent. Mm -hmm. Mina, you were shaking your head affirmatively that the league might be calling Sean Payton here. Is that what you think? I think so. We've had so much conversation about players and their unprofessional behavior. Odell, Tom Brady, Sean Payton should be in that group, too. And you he think the choke sign crossed the line? You think the trip was intentional? A hundred percent. We know what the choke meant. He wasn't thirsty. He didn't eat a Coke. We'll be... <laughs> We're on a horn. We're moving on. Falcons are still outside the playoffs, even with the win. They're the seventh seed in a six-seed tournament that's looking pretty good right now.
And this whole week is kind of a playoff dry run in the NFC. Eagles, Rams, Panthers, Vikings. Whether it brings more clarity or more murk, we'll see. Mina, start with you. What do you think we can learn this week with six of the top seven seeds playing each other? I think we will learn that the Vikings are the best team in the conference, possibly the league. Last time I was on this show, I pointed out the Eagles had played a fairly easy schedule, which I think was borne out. The Vikings, meanwhile, have played the fourth hardest schedule in football. They've beaten the Saints, they've beaten the Rams, and they're going to beat the Panthers. Both teams have good defenses, but the Vikings are more balanced. They are the most complete team in the conference right now. you got that Viking purple behind you, so that's convenient. <laughs> Tim Kalish, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think the Vikings are really good and they're underappreciated, but I think the Eagles are the best team, and I think they're going to show that. I don't think they're going to lose both games out on the West Coast. Uh, I think they're going to beat the Rams and, and put a little distance between those two teams. Now, they, they might still be tied with Minnesota because Minnesota might beat Carolina, but I think we'll, we'll move the Eagles back up a notch after we see what they do. Well, I think the one thing for sure is that we're still going to see murkiness at the bottom of that playoff uh, uh, stack. Uh, we just saw what happened with the Saints um, losing to, to Atlanta. Atlanta kind of at the top of that bottom heap now. They're trying to move in. I think you could see some other teams kind of move up around at the bottom. I don't think there's any question that the top, of the, the, the top two teams um, are going to remain there. Uh, but it's the bottom where it's going to get a little bit. But if uh, Minnesota louder. and Philly go on to win this week, you're willing to put them ahead of the Absolutely. rest of that group. By a substantial margin? Yep, I am. I think okay, you. Yeah, I think that's the clarity that will come from this weekend is Minnesota and Philly separating themselves away from Carolina and from L.A. So there'll be some level of clarity there. I just think Minnesota, the way they're playing defense, as Mina pointed out, and then also Keenum is just playing out of this world as a guy that coming into a position as a backup to the backup where you're not expecting anything but really a game manager and the kind of play he's putting up is separating Minnesota. And then I think Philly is also going to win because of their efficiency and because of the way Wentz is playing right now. I don't think the Rams are going to be able to have a game plan that Wentz doesn't have an answer for. You don't think the Rams defense has a game plan for Wentz? Okay, good. Maybe I don't think that Philly doesn't have an answer for. Nothing they have an answer for. Mita Kimes, you want to address that? Go ahead. Uh, you guys may have forgotten, but the Eagles, they just lost to a team. I think it was uh, Seattle. And if they beat Jacksonville, I do not think it's fair to say that the Eagles are so far ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Focus on Goff Wentz for a second here, because they're going to be compared forever. They went one and two in a draft together. Uh, this might be the start of a rivalry for the future of the league. You can speak to that if you want. But first, who would you rather have Sunday, Gabe? I'm sensing Wentz, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm sensing Wentz, and here's what I meant by a game plan that Wentz won't have an answer for. I think a lot of people are saying that L.A., all right, well, they're going to blitz them, they're going to knock them off balance, but, I mean, Carson Wentz got 12 TD passes when he's being blitzed. He basically responds the best in the NFL when people bring that pressure. So if L.A. does want to lean on bringing pressure to Wentz, like, he has proven himself capable of handling that. And also, Wentz, I pick him not just for this game, but as the quarterback that I would want, simply because there's just more samples of Wentz. Uh, with Goff, it, he's had a fabulous year, but I feel more comfortable picking Wentz because we've seen him last year and this year putting up what are the best numbers out of that draft class. Same question to you, KB. Who'd you rather have Sunday? Well, I think it's splitting hairs, um, but I will lean towards Wentz. Uh, the thing that jumps out to me is his ability to use his legs and the fact that he can call his own plays. I mean, who can, who can forget the fact that he called a game-winning play um, several weeks ago? Uh, but you know what? Don't take anything away from golf because he's going to be playing in a comfortable place. Uh, and the Rams' defense is awfully good. I don't, I don't take it from them that they can't dial up something to confuse, befuddle, and make it a difficult outing for, for Carson Wentz. Kalisha? Excuse me, I seem to remember there was a time we, it was Carson Wentz or Dak Prescott. I, I don't know <laughs> what happened to that discussion. It seems to have been shelved for the oh last boy. month. Maybe oh we'll get back boy. to it at a later date. On this one, uh, I will take Wentz for this game and overall, because if you go back to the draft, people liked everything a little better about Wentz than Goff, except for one thing he hadn't played at a high level in college. That, that's completely gone now because of what he's done in the NFL. But it's a little unfair to Goff because this is his first year being good. It's his first year of having competent coaching, I would say, and, and they still need to put better receivers around him and then see exactly where his ceiling is. Listen to that shot from Kalashaw directed at Jeff Fisher, who kind of looks like a Tim Kalashaw who's been using Just for Man yes. on his mustache. You know, That's a, <laughs> and, and up top. That, I mean, if we're going to be fair there. Mike Mita Kives, please, go ahead. Low. Uh, yeah, it's pretty clearly Wentz who evokes a meme, Tony, I know you're familiar with, which is get you a man who can do both. Yeah. He can throw. 
He can run. He can throw while he runs. Jared Goff isn't great in Sean McVay's scheme, but Carson Wentz improvises when the play breaks down. That's why his QBR is nearly 20 points higher than Jared Goff. That's why he is in the MVP conversation right now and Jared Goff is not. Does anybody see it becoming the Brady Manning rivalry? I mean, that's setting the bar extremely high, but let's, why not set the bar high, you know? Uh, does the league need it to be a rivalry of that type of nature, especially with quarterback play that we've seen in the last couple of years, Kate? You can address that first after the horn. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they need it, but I certainly think that it'd be nice to pass the torch and have fans be able to look at it and say, all right, we know that we're set up and we've got our storylines baked in once these guys, if they ever, retire. Absolutely. I mean, given the fact they were drafted that closely together, it's a built-in rival. Timmy? That Prescott guy, he's still not in this discussion okay, either. Okay, all right. You know, you yeah. really too here? hard for your hometown guy, guy now. There's Sean Kimes after the whole. Uh, there's a rivalry, and it's just Deshaun Watson, who was playing better than Goff before he got injured. Taking a break right here. Buy or sell in two minutes. Okay, so with the award-winning Geico mobile app, our customers have 24-7 access, digital ID, Finals rematch is huge news in baseball today. Shohei Otani signing with the LA Angels. His agent saying this wasn't about market size, time zone, or league. He felt a true bond with the Angels, more so than the Cubs, Rangers, Dodgers, Padres, Yankees, Mariners. Speaking of which, I want to show you what happened minutes ago to one of our panelists upon hearing this news. No! <laughs> no! That was in real time when, when Mina first heard Otani was signing with the Angels. You went through the five stages of grief, Mina. I got to ask you, what are you thinking right now, and what does this do for the Angels and the rest of the American League? I am selling 32 years of Mariners fandom and buying a lifetime of pain. I don't know why he did this. Perhaps to personally devastate me. Um, this is obviously great for the Angels. It's really terrible right. for the Mariners. I can't believe he's going not only to their division rival, but they completely mortgaged their farm system for this. It's absolutely devastating for the for franchise. The mm -hmm. Jeff Passon has no called words. this a potentially franchise-altering signing. Tim Callishaw, you want to address it from a, a more of a baseball perspective and not just the Mina well, Kimes' I mean, heart? It's still such a great unknown. Can a guy pitch and then DH or play in the, you know, in the field a few days a week before he makes his next start? Nobody's done that in about 100 years. I just wrote a column that he would end up in the AL West, and it would come down to two teams, the Mariners and the Rangers. Okay. Oh, no, this team, is about, the, this is about you now, too. I had the division right. It's off of the teams. What it's was the your uh, reaction upon hearing you didn't go to the Rangers? Do we have video of that? No, we don't, because... I don't, I don't think there was... No, you're a blank slate. Go ahead, Kevin Blackstone. My goodness, I'm just glad the Nationals were not in this mix. I, you know, Otani is a great story, but we have to see how he's going to play out. We always hear about these legendary players from Japanese leagues coming over and what they're going to do and how they're going to upset the game. They come in with different pitches, and here's a guy that can come in. He's like the Babe Ruth um, of Asia. Well, we'll just wait and see. Okay, Peggy. Yeah, I, mean, I like this decision for him because it seems like this is one of the spots, maybe in addition to Seattle, though, where there was enough of a, a gap there where the team hadn't already excelled in a way like the Dodgers had, that he can come in and he can actually, actually see the effects of his play on that team, and he's got enough surrounding talent to make that happen. Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. Wow. And you know what? I'm, I'm just happy. I know you're, you're suffering right now, Mina Kimes, but that you can still get to that place in your fandom where it means that much to you. Being so the professional, you unbiased reporter that you now. are. I think that's wonderful. We'll move on. NBA Western Conference standings right now. I'm wondering out loud here. Could it be the first time in four years Warriors haven't been the one seed this late into the season? Rockets, eight straight wins, 9-0 with Chris Paul. Tim Kalashaw, I asked today, December 8th. Not for the first time, definitely not for the last time. Do you buy or sell the Rockets as threats to the Warriors? I buy them as a threat to everybody else in the league but Golden State. I still think when it comes down to it in May or whenever it will be, uh, that the Warriors can defend them. And the, the Rockets are as hard to guard as Golden State for all the other teams. The Golden State can figure it out when they need to. Maybe. You know, right now they look like a threat. Do they look like a threat because of Chris Paul, or do they look like a threat because Steph Curry is not playing right now for the Warriors? I'm going to go with the injury uh, with the Warriors right now. Okay, Fagan. I mean, I'm, I know I'm being hopeful, but my answer is yes, in, in large part because of the sustainability of the offensive side of the ball on the Rockets. Like, that pick and roll between Ryan Anderson and Chris Paul, that's not something you can just defend away the way those two work together, and I see that as sustainable for them going forward. 
Is it true that Anderson's shooting 70% from three yes. when getting assisted by Chris Paul? That's incredible. Mina Khan. Uh, the Warriors are better, but I do buy them as a threat because we've seen so many secondary players on the Rockets step up and improve. Not just Anderson, but Capella, Ariza, Gordon. All of these players are progressing, which means that they could be better by the end of the season. Look at their net rating. Their net rating is uh, uh, top seven of the last ten years. There's about five Warriors teams in there and a Celtics team in there. But that Rockets team right now for three, uh, well, two months of the season. We'll move on. Buy or sell three. Hope Solo running for U.S. soccer president. Her Facebook post announcing her candidacy was over 1,600 words. She talked about knowing how to win, prioritizing diversity and equality and women's issues. Kevin, we've talked about Hope Solo quite a bit in this show. Her history on and off the field, somewhat checkered. Does she deserve a fair chance to be president? Well, I think she deserves a fair chance. I mean, she's passionate. She's, she's a winner. She does represent uh, the soccer player that U.S. soccer needs to recruit. The problem is, is that they ran her out because of her passion, which was absolutely ridiculous. And so based on that, I can't see them actually giving her a fair shake. Okay, Fagan. I don't think she'll get one, uh, and I'm not sure that I think Hope Solo should be president of U.S. soccer, even if she's bringing up key issues. You would want a president, one, hopefully, to unify. Hope Solo's got to be one of the most div divisive people in U.S. soccer history, and two, you want them to bring in good people and surround themselves with good people, and if you look at her historically, like, that has not been top of her list, surrounding herself with really smart people who make great decisions. Media Combs? I think she deserves a shot. She's laid out a good platform, but I agree with Kate. I don't think she's the best candidate, you know, not just because of the controversies around her in her past, but because those controversies involve interpersonal issues with teammates. One would think you would need someone who can manage in this role. She does not prove that she can do that. Tim Kalashaw. I think her passion's great. I think she's on the right track as far as this being a rich kid sport, and that needs to change. But Kate's right. It's somebody, the president's got to negotiate with people. they got to be diplomatic. I hardly think that's probably going to be her. Willing to be diplomatic right now, Tim Kalashaw. Kevin Blackstone. I don't know why I should be at this point. <laughs> why would I be Your weekend starts right now. That's a good thing. Mina Kimes, Kate Fagan. That's our showdown. In two minutes. Did they say what time they'd get here? Around five. With multi looking showdown, Jaleel Okafor. And whether he can restart his career in Brooklyn. If it felt like Philly was trying to trade him since they drafted him. It's because they were, and that feeling might be mutual. Mina, can he hit the reset button? I think he can. Look, his game is not modern. He can't shoot from distance. He can't really defend the rim, but he can score. And we have seen players like Ennis Cantor have useful careers doing just that. Yeah, I think he's going to be fine in Brooklyn. I think it actually makes Brooklyn almost on the list of teams that I want to watch. It's like they're like the group of the washed-up 2015 stars with D'Angelo Russell and now Okafor. I mean... That what makes it kind great, of exciting in my book. What a great title. Almost on the list of teams. Yeah, yeah. I kind of almost want to watch. <laughs> Point Kives. Lakers 107, Sixers 104 last night. This game had a flop from Bogan. A hangout from Jared Bayless in the front row that lasted long enough that it could have given him a shot clock violation. Lonzo Ball to Brandon Ingram for the game winner, which Jordan Clarkson had some choice words about it that Serena Winters put down uh, on Twitter. Look at all the maternal truckers in there. Kate, what stood out most from last night? I mean, it stood out to me that this is basically a preview of, like, the NBA's best rivalry in 2022. That's essentially what we're watching here is a bunch of guys who are like 20 and 21 and they're giving us a preview of the NBA future. Uh, I got to go with Bayless sitting on the fans lap like he's a mall Santa Claus. If you listen closely, he was asking, please just let Joel Embiid stay healthy. That's my Christmas wish. Kate, would you put this on the list of future robberies that you almost kind of believe could be a future robbery that you might want to watch? No, I'm pretty confident about this one, Tony. Thank you, Kate, for your confidence. Here's a point, just to make it interesting. Showdown 3, my favorite story in the show. St. Louis Blues needed a goalie in case of emergency last night. They promoted a season ticket holder, a vending machine worker by day. Tyler Stewart gave him a daily contract. He dressed up, took pregame warm-ups. Didn't get in the game, though, Mina. So I ask you, dream come true if you don't get minutes on the ice for the game? I think so. I think it's a fun idea. I think it's perhaps something we should do for around the horn. Get one of our viewers, have them on deck at all times. Might I suggest our colleagues to guts? I mean, this is something we all got to relate to, right? Oh, Maybe boy. it was just me, but oh, like eight-year-olds actually showing up with the gear to a baseball game to Fenway Park and thinking maybe they could get in the game. This is everybody's dream. 
<laughs> Did Mina just tank it and I didn't even need to say anything? Absolutely. Take the FaceTime, Kate Fagan. <laughs> All right, I don't know if y'all saw, but Japan 2020 released three options for potential mascots for those Olympics, and I'm going to campaign hardcore for option C. I think if you take a look right there, you'll see that the fox and the raccoon are absolutely the correct choice. I mean, there's a nod to Japanese fairy tales in there, and also, they're the only two that are actual animals. The other are just sort of like Mega Man wannabes. So, candidate C. Okay. Mascot. Hey,